This segment of the CU Podcast is sponsored by Magic Spoon. Cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid, but as an adult, I gave it up because I realized it was full of sugar and junk that wasn't good for me. I've cut down on carbs and sugar, but I still love snacking on cereal. So thankfully, Magic Spoon is here. It's cereal reinvented. Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs in each serving. Honey Nut has one gram of sugar. There's only 140 calories per serving. Magic Spoon cereal bars have one gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and only 130 calories per bar. They're all keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, and soy free. The flavors are great. I'm eating one of my favorites, peanut butter, but there are also the original best sellers, cocoa, fruity, and frosted, plus other ones like cinnamon roll and blueberry muffin. And Magic Spoon has other tasty flavors like maple waffle and cookies and cream. Magic Spoon is delicious and tastes just like the cereal from our childhood, but it's great for those who are carb conscious. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own variety box and use our code CONTRI, C-O-N-T-R-I, for $5 off. You can choose from the best-selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cinnamon roll, and so many more. But wait, Magic Spoon is now adding the most anticipated and coveted fan-favorite flavor, birthday cake, to their permanent collection that will now be available for purchase year-round. This is big. What was once only available once a year for a limited time can now be enjoyed all the time, so be sure to add birthday cake to your custom box today. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Also for our Canadian and British cereal fans, Magic Spoon also ships to Canada and the UK. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code CONTRI, C-O-N-T-R-I for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash country to save $5 off your order today. And be sure to add the fan favorite birthday cake to your custom box. Get yourself a yummy, yummy bowl of Magic Spoon. Okay, we're going to do voicemails. Uh, uh, you go to anchor.fm slash CU podcast. Well, we'll, on the super shows, we'll, we'll maybe do voicemails. This is the last regular voicemail. This is number 100, by the way. Oh, wow. And thank you so much for your voicemails throughout the... Uh, throughout the uh well, the years that we've been doing yeah it. they've been fun two years of this worked out better than q a and oh uh -oh, the patreon folks are going to be angry at you for saying that Ian. i wouldn't say that no i don't mean like the uh, polls i mean like when we used to do the old q a topics oh you started, know, you know started getting fresher stuff yeah gotcha all right first one hey guys john from lloydminster canada Normally, I don't bother with screen filters or scan lines when playing retro games and modern stuff. Mm -hmm. But I find there are some games that really benefit from having their sharp edges softened a little bit. Mostly the Mode 7 games, or especially the Donkey Kong Country series. And of course, I love a good Game Boy LCD overlay. So I was curious, are there any retro games where you do turn on any kind of screen filters? Or is it just raw pixels all the time? Thank you. I like uh, I like scan lines when they're done well, and that that's the issue. I do think scan lines. I, I think it's very much necessary to kind of get the the the, the true vision of what they were going for, because um, raw pixels looks like trash most of the time. Yeah, you need the scan lines. You need the the things that soften it. You that's need, how artists work. Yeah, artists need, didn't have LCD right, monitors. You needed to yeah. utilize the technology at the time. So. Yeah. It, it's not so much that there are certain games, but I, I mean, all retro games in theory, I would like, to, you know, with some sort of scan lines. It's just I've had some converters that have great scan lines and some that have, you know, really shitty artificial scan lines. So I don't always use them. So it's, it's about finding the proper balance. Yeah, I guess. This is Andrew from Bath in England, a town named after water heated by boiling hot magma. But what <laughs> is your favorite water in a game? You guys obviously call it water. Now, this could be a topic, so don't answer if you don't want it, but it could be graphics, gimmick, a level, the entire hmm. game, what, whatever. Um, yeah, what is your favorite water? Party on Pat and party on Ian. You know, I don't say many nice things about the N64, but uh, Wave Race 64 is a lot of fun. Good water in that game. Giles Goddard did that game. Game's the, amazing. The physics in that game is incredible. Yeah. The I mean, physics, the, the physics in that game. It still feels is, great to play. Giles also did the Mario stretchy face on the intro screen for Mario 4. He's a he's a certified genius. I mean Star Fox. Yeah, he's a he's a freaking Oh no, genius. was he was he Star Fox? No, uh 1080 snowboarding. Yes. So he was a first party dev and now works with our fine friends at Chuhai. Uh so um Wave Race, good you said that because I would have forgotten that. Um but I reviewed it on a certain N64 guidebook. 
the waves are have a logic and rhythm to how you move, yet there's randomness and you have to control and steer with. It's like you're really on a fucking jet ski. It's a great, it's the, a great game. The, the two or three times I was on a wave runner in my life, that's what it sort of feels like. You work with the waves sometimes, you fight against it. It's fucking brilliant. I was going to say the Mr. Gimmick scene in level two where you're on the seaside, just chilling on the right side by the ship, the pirate ship. You've seen the little oh, yeah, singles yeah, yeah, go by. Yeah. It's, just, it's just calm. But if you fall in, you see that splash. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is Matt on the South Shore of Massachusetts. Pat, I'm also Matt C. on Twitch, one of the gifting goats. I love you guys, and I'll miss the weekly podcast, but thanks so much for the quality content you guys have given us over the years. I'm looking forward to what's next. Now that I've buttered you guys up, though, I should probably get to the topic of my voicemail. I followed your analysis of the graded game issue, and I agree with everything you guys have said, especially given all of WADA's scandals. That said, I am a total hypocrite, and I bought a WADA graded game the other day. Well, it was Gun Knack on NES. Uh oh. All right. Even though WADA is terrible, and I'm probably going to hell for this purchase, Gun Knack is actually rare, even according to their own alleged population report. And it seemed like a good deal, at least from what I could tell on price charting. Five stars, according to Ian. Uh, Great game. So I'm just wondering what you guys think about this purchase. Um, am I a piece of shit, or no. can some people change? I, I don't. I don't. I don't I feel anything about. I mean, it's a white Ferrari, slick back hair. And I, <laughs> no, man, relax, man. You're fine. Yeah, We're it's fine. it's. I, fine. I I I I don't care if anyone buys. It's not people who buy graded games, especially people who just want to buy a couple of them. It's the. It, it, it's the collusion from the top. Yes. I don't have It was interest. not formed naturally the market. I do not have interest yeah. in collecting any slab sealed graded games. There's maybe two or three I could think of that I would ever want. Um, but that does not mean that you are bad for wanting them. I think it's a little silly. No, I, I know people that, that have the but, games. But yeah, I mean, it's fine. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's fine. It's good. It is what it is. Uh, he had another one. I, I had let, I had play next week for some reason. Did I play this one already? Hey, Pat and Ian. It's Matt in Massachusetts again. I forgot to mention that that copy of Gun Knack is sealed, uh, and my motivations really Se aren't about speculating or investing or any of that. I okay, Matt, we, we, we you're good, Matt. You're good. You, don't you, worry we, about we, it. We're, we're a bunch. <laughs> we're, we're a bunch of drunken podcasters here. We're we don't, fun. We don't matter. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Harold from Henderson, Nevada, right outside Las Vegas, and I was wondering, you have an invitation for the 2024 Kumite in Hong Kong. Who is your Shidoshi going to be? <laughs> is it going to be Van Damme, Donald Gibb, Bolo Young, or perhaps Bruce Springsteen? Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work. <laughs> Bruce the... Springsteen? Where did that come from? It's a line in the movie? What, what, what Patrick. Oh, oh, Bruce Springsteen is Shidoshi. I don't okay. care if yeah. Bruce Springsteen yeah. is Shidoshi. Yeah. Uh, what's the big deal if Bruce, Bruce Springsteen is a Shidoshi? There's the one. Uh, I, would, uh, I would go with Bolo. Absolutely. Yeah, but he's got to cheat. That was the only thing about that movie. The cheating thing came out of nowhere. Not to criticize Bloodsport. You yes. No, I know. But that came out of nowhere. That's the, it. Yeah. The, the, he didn't need that to win. No. He, he was tearing through everyone else. They had to find a way to up the ante. At yeah. The they, they need to do the blind thing. And yeah. I was just like, I get it. It is one of the weakest spots of the movie, though. I, I agree. But the reaction. Ah! Ah! One of the greatest I mean, spots of the he's movie. He's a great. Uh, Van Damme emotes so well. He's so under Like, the oh. emote. He, I mean, line delivery is one thing, but emoting. Yeah. He's a very good right. at emoting. No one, can, <laughs> no one gets their ass kicked better than Van Damme. Rock, take notes from Van Damme. Well, that's why Van Damme yeah. got all those movies. They're like 15 in a row. You know, I mean, it was the same. No, it wasn't the same role. They, they went back and forth. Cyborg's underrated. <laughs> the effects of Cyborg are bad, though. Next. Hey, guys. Jamie from Toledo here. Did you guys hear what Ric Flair said to Tommy Tellerico when he fronted him? That's when they brought him back with yeah. Bischoff. Also, Ian, oh. who is the worst non-boss enemy to fight in Doom, and why is it the Pain Elemental? Thanks, guys. Pain Elemental is cheap as hell. Uh, I would say the uh, which one's the Pain Elemental? The I one was going to say that, Revenant, which is the one that that hits you wherever you are on the screen. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the Pain Elemental. Yeah, yeah. that's a cheap boss. Yeah, yeah, or not even boss. It's, it's, it's just by an the enemy. second game, it's not a boss. It's, it appears every now and then. It was a mini boss. So fucking cheap. You guys got to run the hell away when you see it. Because it'll hit you wherever you are. It's an instant hit. Uh, next. Hey, Pat and Ian. It's uh, V from Manhattan. I uh, wanted to thank you guys for 10 years plus of great content as you guys are wrapping up the podcast. 
and also let you know that, uh, you know, you're so right about these things still being out there. I was going to a liquidation auction to buy a forklift and uh, it happened to be a retail liquidator uh, storage house and they had uh, boxes and boxes of sealed Ninja Turtles action figures. Yeah. Uh, the samurai ones like I had when I was a kid. So I picked those up. But also they had shipping containers of Nintendo games. And I ended up with Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, a six pack of them. Oh. So don't know really what to do with them, but thought, hey, too good to let go. And yeah, they really are in the wild, so they're not as rare as you think. Of course they so are. For the podcast, hope you guys keep doing something new. Where do you think a lot of these sealed games come from? They're not all just people who bought them and didn't, you know, play them. Right. They come from somewhere. These are mass-produced com- com- consumer items. Yeah. The freaking Star Wars jackpot that was found a few months ago we talked oh, yeah. about. Mm-hmm. Like, these things... These things happen. People either bought things and didn't uh, use them or just had them or stores went out of business or, sto- or they were in storage. Always what happened with, with Toys R Us, they, if they would liquidate a lot of stuff. To- uh, Channel, uh, Toys R Us probably liquidated them to like odd job where I remember seeing a fucking literal aisle of Star Wars figures. Ian. Like, I mean like pegged up for an aisle of them. Next. Hey, Penny, this is Gizmo from California. Thank you, Gizmo. And I want to ask about magazines. Uh, you know, we all grew up with uh, electronic gaming uh, PlayStation Magazine and Nintendo Power when it came to video games. But when it comes to comic books, I grew up with the Wizard Magazine. Love it Wizard. was originally a comic book uh, pricing uh, magazine, but then it later on became one for comic book news, like mm-hmm. you know, merch, artists, that kind of thing. Uh, I was w- wondering if not only you guys have read the magazine, but I was wondering if, uh, what your guys' thoughts on which one made the bigger impact on their culture. Nintendo Power or wizard i think if you're listening in uh hope to hear from you that's a tough one because i mean the comic industry was huge whether or not wizard was around then um it was blowing up in the early to mid 90s and before the crash so i mean that's tough i mean i I went i bought wizard every month for like two years i think i used to have all the issues for like i want to say like 93 to 95 maybe 96 i was into it God, there were some good centerfolds in there some uh superhero babes i remember that (laughs) it was a good uh storm centerfold one one uh but anyway, so I don't know. That's a tough one. Nintendo Power to, like, here's the thing. Nintendo Power was for a younger audience in general than Wizard. And Nintendo Power was literally strict advertising to kids to find out about the games that would never, I would never found out about Top Secret episode if it wasn't for sure. Nintendo Power. No, absolutely. Those it was games, how they advertised. Those games would never have been, Top Secret episode's a common game. It would never have been a common game and bought by a lot of kids if they didn't know it was Nintendo Power. So that's what I mean, like, you're still going to buy, people are going to buy Spider-Man accounts no matter what. You know what I mean? Like, so it's kind of tough, but I do remember loving Wizard. I, I mean, I used to, like I said, I died for like two years. I shouldn't have gotten rid of those. Some of those probably worth money, the older ones. They Maybe. started, they started what, early 90s they started? Like 991, top of my head. Well, I, I used to get that in action figure and toy review. They had the price guy for the toys, mm-hmm. what toys come in. That's what the two I used to get a lot. Next. Hey guys, Zach in Ottawa calling. Uh, first of all, congratulations uh, on the somewhat retirement at 350. A little bittersweet, but well deserved. Um, just thinking uh, what you guys might want to do after this. Uh, I would personally love if you guys did like a, I don't know, like a pinball one. Uh, what? You know, every couple months. It doesn't have to be too often. You know, pinball world isn't as as fast moving with news uh, as video games. But uh, yeah, I'd love to listen to your guys' thoughts I, on, on pins, old and new. I think the problem is we run out of things to talk about on a pinball one, just in terms of like not enough new news. Uh, so... Uh, one of my friends and I have considered doing a pinball thing, but it would very clearly be like a what no more than once a month, maybe every two months sort of thing. Is there a pinball podcast or has to be? A there pinball is. Podcast? I'm sure there is. There, it good? There, there absolutely is. But but yeah, I would love to cover more pinball. But exactly. The, the world doesn't move as fast. So you mm. either are making a very short podcast or. Or you do something where you go over tables or years, sure. you know, it, it, it's it's not, there's not infinite content there. Sure. I'm going to finish this statement here. Uh, I love 90s pins. I've got uh, four myself and we actually have tournaments every two months at my place. Maybe something like that would interest you guys uh, in in terms of a a show. I don't know. Wait, 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 wait. You want, you want to talk about your, your pinball? Uh, no, owning tournament. our pinball machines, I think. Okay. Uh, I would need some, uh, I would need to be bankrolled for that. <laughs> Next, skip, skip. Next from the Geek, Geek Commentator. Hey, Pat. Hey, Ian. Uh, this is the Geek Commentator over on Twitter. 
Over the years, uh, 20 plus, I've amassed a small collection of games, uh, roughly 3,700 or so. And wait, 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 hold on. Variants. Wait, you sounded crazy to me. 3,700 is small? Is being facetious. It's uh, across multiple system generations. And I've reached a point where I think I need to pare this collection down. The problem is every time I start looking at that, I get very, very overwhelmed. Do you all have any suggestions on how I should, you know, start this process as well as places and sites I should sell these games to get the maximum amount of value out of it? Really enjoyed the podcast over the past few years, and I'm really going to miss it when it's gone. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We'll still be here, geek. So I would say that in terms of like websites and places, people have asked us that for years. We don't know anything that no one else, you know, that, sure. that other people don't at this point. Just go to, a, uh, you know, as I always say, sell oh. your very expensive stuff individually, group everything else into a lot and get rid of it. How much time do you have? That's the question. How much time yeah. do you want to invest? The more time you invest, the longer the stuff kicks around. It's more time of individual listing and packaging and mailing out, do you really want to do that or offload it bulk to someone and get the cash and you're good? Yeah. Does your time matter? That's the big question. As long as, you know, this is not a, a decision that's being made because you need the money, uh, it's worth not making it all back to just get rid of it and make it easier. Sure. And also, I, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, I said it when Pat was talking about getting rid of stuff. Start with a collection that you don't particularly care about. I find it's very hard to whittle down collections. Like, I'm going to keep some of this, and I'm going to keep some sure. of this. It's, look, I like my PC Engine stuff. I keep all my PC Engine stuff. Everything else, I just sure. started getting rid of. You know, you, you don't try sure. to hold on to certain things within collections. Just kind of, like, tell yourself, okay, this collection's gone. Just take one you don't like sell off like a third of it and see how you feel. Right. And like I said to Pat, you're going to see that it just feels good to get rid of it. And then you're going to start selling all of all it right. off. General Q and A's got to keep it rolling. Yep. <laughs> yeah, we do. Hey guys, Cindy from Tacoma here. Once again, I recently completed my NES complete in box game show, video game collection. <laughs> I love it. With the last one being fun house, <laughs> oh, which went for too much money, uh, 150 to $200, something along those lines. That's insane. My question for you two is, it's not worth have that you much, played the game? And yes, how yes, much awesome. of a portrayal it. was it, in your opinion, from the awesomeness that was the show to whatever? The yeah, hell they, they took another game. game. Yeah, they, they took. They, yeah. they clicked. Have a nice they took another game. There they, was there was a, a computer game that was Funhouse uh, with JD. That was different than this one. Yes, that but was. They took a different. Uh, I believe it was a C sixty four game yeah, it was, and ported yeah. it and just called it Funhouse. It, was, it has literally nothing to do. It with was it. a disgrace. Yeah, it's awful. It was a disgrace. I think I, I, think I did that review in the guidebook. I mean, if it was any other game, it'd be okay. No. But it was no. bad to begin with, but definitely a letdown. Hey, guys. Oh. Uh, I want to thank you both for all the years of weekly podcasts that you two have done. Uh, so my question is this. Are there any online retro console repair services out there that jump to your mind? No. I no. ask this because I often wonder how gaming preservation will look like in the future, especially when it comes to um, game systems with moving parts. Like, um, So they, they advertise... I remember I got the, the guy who did my Sega CD and my Turbo Duo uh, literally advertised on eBay the services. Like I searched for like repair and came up and then we worked out prices. Like that's basically what happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, I basically paid him a price. Then there's, here's my list of price. Like you can find it. Go there on are forums, people. Around. I just don't know of any like go to spots. Yeah. It's Rich from Review Tech USA here. Look, I don't appreciate you guys commenting on my humor. It's not always about gay people and sex. It's usually about birds. That's why I keep these plastic chickens on my desk so I can annoy my followers by making out with them uncomfortably at the start and end of every episode. In fact, I'm going to end this voicemail while making out with a bird. Oh, I love birds. Oh, birds. Oh, birds. I'm taking my shirt off now. You can cut me off. I don't care. Birds. Oh, birds. Oh, birds. You can cut him off. <laughs> I mean, if that's true, I actually kind of feel sad. For uh, Rich, I actually don't, don't want to make fun of that. That's fucking sad if that's how you entertain people. I feel nothing. Next. Hi, Pat. Hi, Yen. It's Greg with my shitty French accent. Sound like I have accent. a question for both of you. Let's imagine for a second that someone very wealthy and very dedicated could produce perfect NES games counterfeits. I mean, literally perfect. No experts can tell the difference with an original. Would it be the best or the worst thing that could happen to the collector's community? <laughs> and as a bonus, same question, but these same games are officially backed by Nintendo and become legit products. 
would your answer be different then? I think, Greg, you yes. should talk to Alex Fasciani because you can have that great conversation about how the market would, would do if you re release like Super Mario 3 as a working NES cart. I mean, yeah, I guess you can do it perfect if somehow it would cost you you know tens of millions of dollars to do the chips the exact same way and the the plastic oh. the exact same way and the color like it's just not possible but i don't know i actually don't know uh, i mean uh, i i mean i feel like the question itself is fun though you just oh, yeah. suspension of disbelief what do i sure. think would happen it would tank the collectability of the oh, it would sure. take, it'd tank the value but if the they're value. truly indistinguishable at some point you just take a deep breath and you let go and you just whatever i mean sure. if you're collecting it and you're having fun at that point you don't have to worry about counterfeits i guess sure. hey what's up guys it's phil bowser hey phil again wanted to touch base i know you mentioned your favorite condiments previously but wanted to ask you what's some of your go-to foods that you could eat every day breakfast lunch or dinner doesn't matter for me it's uh yellow rice black beans mm. and chicken with fresh pico and sauces Mm. So really interested to hear. It's fucking starving. Thanks. Um, Every day, I could eat gyros at almost any time. Really, I, I fucking love I a gyro. Like a oh, gyro. I fucking love. Really? Yeah. We should go. We should go. Love for, them. For, there's a couple of Greek. Uh, there's a number of good ones yeah, around right here. Portland. Believe me, I'm aware of all of them. I love, 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 or, love, or, love, or, love or, those. or even going to the chain one is not bad. Um, one. Burritos, obviously. Breakfast burritos, breakfast burritos a, 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 especially. Uh, yes. Uh, I think a breakfast burrito is one of the finest things ever made. Yes. A good breakfast burrito. Uh, yes. Bagels and good bread with butter. Good bread with butter. There you go. You're going, you're going basic. I That was my dinner hey, on Saturday. Hey, I this a is Jared from Brooklyn Park. Hey, and Jared. as a pixel artist, I'm wondering what games have your favorite pixel or sprite art? And if you have any favorite pixel artists in general. That's Thanks. tough. I don't keep the podcast. About. I wish I could tell you more about the pixel artists that I really, really like, but uh, the names don't come to my mind right now. And uh, maybe I'll shout them out on Twitter later because I do know I can find the names of some of them. Um, in terms of games, I always really, really liked the Dragon Quest sprite work. Uh, really starting with like two and three. I loved the uh, as a kid, uh, those monster designs were my favorite. And those were done by uh, Akira Toriyama. I'll just say this. The, some of my favorite graphics of any game is Super Mario 2. I just love that style. It's great. And it's just cute and, and bubbly and colorful. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is AJ from Madison, Wisconsin. Hey, AJ. Not Wondering AJ. what the video game would look like of your life. <laughs> so maybe five levels. Um, what would the levels be? What would, would there be mini bosses, kind of main bosses? I'm sure at some point Pat would have a level uh, that involves Suncoast video. <laughs> Ian would have one that involved ranch dressing in a bathroom. Um, and maybe finally, what would be your weapon of choice throughout the game? Thanks, Might guys. be like Back to the Future mini games. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I dole out VHS tapes while, while, while trying to avoid sexual harassment at Suncoast. That could be a fun one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, know. The first level would be a pleasant youth. Uh, the next three levels would be screaming fucking insanity. And the last level would be, uh, 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 you know, enjoying 40. <laughs> enjoying 40 and, yeah. and making roast beef sandwiches <laughs> for friends. Beef sandwiches. My weapon would be a bat. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is Scott from New Hampshire. Hey, Scott. I was just wondering what your favorite moment from gaming is um for example what i mean by that is for me my favorite retro gaming moment that i'll always have um and that i always think of when i'm when i'm nostalgic for gaming um is that part in the link to the past where you find the forest um and you find the master sword in the forest and all the animal sprites are popping out um before you claim the sword i didn't know if there was any like special moment that you think of That's that a tough one. you've kind of carried through the years um, in, in terms of gaming. Thanks so much. Um, Love the podcast. Have a great one. Escape from the Island in Contra, the explosions. That was like one of the first like really big endings to a game I remember. I was like, wow, that's like a cinematic ending. It was 88. It was pretty early for that stuff. That's up there. Uh, I, the one reason I love Act Razor, I'm not even, yeah, you know, I'm not super religious, but the spirituality in Act Razor I love. And it's it's kind of, it's touching when the, the guy who's dying asks for, asks for rain before he dies. And so mm -hmm. you do the rain, and then he dies happily, knowing that you know whatever tears from heaven. I'm like, that kind of got me. There's some, there's some, there's some tear jerkers in that game. I'm like, that's you know, you're a nice god helping out your people. I guess that's that's fun. Wait, what was the question though? About your favorite moments in game? Oh, favorite like, moments, like, right? Yeah, like, yeah, like little moments. Um, 
I think Final Fantasy IX actually holds a lot for me. And these aren't huge spoilers, but if you've never played this game, jump ahead 45 seconds or a minute or whatever. <laughs> but there's the point where Queen and Vivi get married. That's very, very adorable. Uh, but the whole like near the end section where Alexander pulls up and has the big armor out over the city and you're running around with Cypher and Vivi. And it's just it's a great game. And I'll always remember that um, Final Fantasy seven had some for me. I think a lot of this sticks out in my head because it was that turn of console gaming from sprite uh -huh. work to 3D. So even though not a lot of those scenes like the cinematics and stuff, I'd go back to today and be like, yeah, whatever. They stick out as bigger in my head because they were so big to me the first time I saw them. Omega gotcha. repping, ripping through that city in FF7, all that stuff. Hey guys, Budweiser Tall Cans from California here. <laughs> mm. Can you tell me a game that changed your opinion on a genre? Take care. Arkanoid. Ball and Pile games, whatever. Pawn type clones. I hated Breakout whenever I saw it. I, was like, I don't want to play this. Arkanoid was, is magic. That's the peak of the genre. Obviously. Never got better than that. Um, uh, that, was, that was big for me. Splatoon. Splatoon got me really? into online competitive third person shooters. Okay. Um, I mean, I've always kind of enjoyed that, but I've always like kind of, I don't know. I never do dove in. That was a game that I started playing and I was like, I want to get good at this. So I, it's not even so much the genre that's unique. It's the fact that it got me into regularly playing a game online. Uh, uh, I think maybe competitive game. There was something there, that's not like Mario Kart where it's like whatever sure. roll the dice. And there were military real-time strategies before Warcraft 2, but there wasn't a huge amount of them. Um uh but Warcraft 2 was like that got me into it. I'm like, wow, this is a cool genre. That, that game was a masterpiece. That's probably why. The, the audio, the video, the, the graphics, mm -hmm. all the everything's balanced perfectly in that game between the two sides. Maybe that's why. Hello, this is Alex calling in again from Oslo, Norway. Um, Pat, I was wondering, what would it look like if they were to make a Super Nintendo-style game called Lil Pat Country's Thick But Quick Street Tennis? Who would be some of the characters? What would be some of the abilities they had? I've always been curious to know this after hearing about street tennis. Thanks I mean, so they, did, they did the street basketball, street baseball, I believe, the street football games on the computer. That's where I get it from. Uh, uh, you add graffiti to the field is what you do. He had some. Graffiti. Well, it was a street, Ian. It wasn't yeah. a field. Yes, yeah. you make was, it. You make it concrete. You have cars that come that yeah. can hit you while you're playing, which happened. We we use crack. The, the, literally, the cracks form the tennis court. Like in the middle, there was a crack for the net, and we said like, "Oh, you got to go like two or three inches over the crack." We should have like spray painted a larger area. That's what you do. You spray paint like a middle area for like a net. You spray paint it. You know, I don't know. You have like power, accuracy, stamina, because I got Mary. You got to chase the balls down before they go in the sewer. There's no back. There's no back uh, drop to you there. So that's all that. If you run out of balls, you lose. If they go down the sewer, we lost like one ball a week. But you know they're cheap tennis balls. That's funny. Don't give me any ideas. I have more time now without a weekly pause. I can do this game. Let me know ideas. Do a few more. Hey Pat. Hey Ian. This is Mike from New Jersey. Mike, um, one of my favorite portions of the podcast is when Pat talks about Seaside Heights. Um, I myself, I'm a, you know, I was born in 1988. I was Youngster. raised up in North Jersey and we had, we were fortunate to have a short house down in Lavalette. Uh, you know, the last day of school, we pack up our car, go down there and we stay down there until Labor Day. Come right back. Wow. Real the summer. best summers of my life. Wow. Um, That's so awesome. my, I guess my question is, well, Pat, when you came down here, was were you at like a family's house? Did you do like a one day? Uh, my grandma had a house in, in Seaside Heights. My cousin had a house in Lavalette, which is two towns over. It's a nicer area than Seaside, mm. a little more well-to-do, not as grimy as Seaside. And uh, what's next? A in and out kind of thing, a weekend. We would do weekends and we would do weeks. So the, the grandma's house was divided like certain uh, the cousins that didn't have a house, mm. their own house, because we were an upper middle class. They divide it out like you get like two weeks of summer. There was, there was like five siblings. So they, they divide it up. But you would do like weekend trips and things like that because it was only an hour, 15 minutes away. Gotcha, it wasn't yeah. that far. Not so bad. Uh, I'm just curious about where you you know actually stayed down here. Seaside. Um, Seaside. And my other comment or question was, besides Seaside Heights, what other spots uh, were memorable to you? For me, it was Smuggler's Quay. Th th that's literally near where my grandma's house was. Smuggler's Quay was a one of the the best mini golf I've ever played. It was on a high hill. It's where Rainbow ooh. Rapids used to be. Huh? I said, ooh, I love mini And it golf. was very, it was the model, I think, at the time for, this was like the first big, like, deluxe mini golf I ever heard of. It's, we're talking like they made this like in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. 
and they tore down Rainbow Rapids, which was a, a water park that was there. And they made this like I think that was it's actually the, I think it was thirty six holes. It was that big. They had two different courses wow. to do. Yeah, or, yeah. I don't think I don't think it's still there, unfortunately. But like it was amazing. And you can lose your ball in the streams. You literally had to have a catcher uh, to catch it, or else you had to go back to the front desk and get a ball. It was that. It was that cool. Yeah. Uh, next. The mini golf course in the area. Yeah. Waterworks, which was Waterworks is it's still there. Waterworks was the big water park, a block from Casino Pier. It used to be sponsored by Pepsi. Every Saturday or Tuesday, you you got an extra hour. First of all, you got an extra hour. You went, they open at ten usually. You got two hour blocks. You get a wristband. You go nine a.m. on a Saturday. You get an extra hour for free. It was fucking freezing at nine, but we didn't care because you got an extra hour and you got your free Pepsi sponsored Waterworks shirt. Okay. I wish I still had that. It was you know always a banger to go to Waterworks and Seaside the same day. And Barnacle Bills. I Barnacle guess, Bills. Like I mean, we're, I mean, God, you, you, that's my right, Barnacle okay, Bills was like, the Lavalette uh, mini golf and arcade I told you about, where they'd have. That's where I discovered Simpsons Arcade, Neo Geo games. They had all the fresh stuff uh, at Barnacle Bills, and a decent mini golf was not as good as one. Like Barnacle Bills was great. It was like like a house that had the arcade games, mini golf outside, and then next door was the ice cream shop you already went to. God damn it! I want to. Um, I, I mean, I can sell my games and get a freaking nice uh, shore house in Jersey. I think I think I'm leaning towards that, to be honest. And let's uh, let's check in with one last uh, like like your notes. I wasn't going to do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to it off camera. No, uh, no, no, no. I, was, I just I don't want to deal with it. Okay, <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> well, and, and then we might have to listen to someone, someone that we know and love. Hey guys, this is an anonymous phone call. I just wanted to tell you how happy I am that you guys are stopping the podcast because the world would be so much better off without you because you're terrible human beings. I know lots of people were sending you comments like, oh no, please don't go. Yeah, cry more, you little bitches. Cry more. I drink the salt from your tears. Do you know what fucking time it is? What? I said, do you know what fucking time it is? No, because time is an illusion. What? I said time is an illusion. <laughs> okay, uh, well, I, I got to go because I don't want to wake the neighbors. But you guys have a nice life, okay? Bye. Thank you, person <laughs> who may, may not be Tommy. Tommy. Thank you so much, Tommy. Well, really wanted that send off from Tommy. I'm yeah, glad we, we got we it. it. We, right in our heart. Well, that's right it. That's it. That's it for 350, the last regular podcast. How does it feel, Ian? 10 years about from Ben Affleck to uh, to uh, Amico and Wada. And... I think I'm going to have to think back on that and we'll get to it in a special. Because uh, uh, right it? now, all I'm thinking about is getting a little more caffeine in me and a snack. Really, that it comes back to food. Is that comes, right? <laughs> it always comes well, back to food? That's that's a good that's a good final word, Ian. <laughs> I know I got um, a little leftover ro lo leftover roast beef oh, in the fridge. Oh, oh, well, yeah. could have brought that over. Thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the Girl Scout cookies. You're welcome. Well, yeah, it, it's been uh, it's been a fun experience. We're still going to be around. It's been real, but uh, something that you know, obviously, we both are proud of doing a regular podcast for ten years is insane. Yeah, so many burnout probably before like a year or six months, we're like the 1% that lasted 10 years probably, if not less than that. And thanks to everyone out there for following our, our dumb adventures for Yeah, so thank long. you for the support and all the kind words because as much as we may, you know, talk about, uh, you know, people, you know, who have wronged us or been mean to us or whatever, um, I've received 500 times more than that in terms of, um, sure, you know, people just checking in and saying thanks. Yes. Yeah, the well balanced people. They appreciate like tons and tons yeah. of appreciation. And I appreciate that because still to this day, we've done this for 10 years. And I mean, I go home and I, I, I it's not that I forget about it, but I don't watch it. I don't exist in this space outside of doing podcasts. I don't listen sure. to podcasts. So I'm not aware of it. Um, so it's nice to know that I, it, it's meant something to some of you. Uh, you know, I've, I told a couple people this yesterday. The nicest thing I can hear is that the podcast got you through work or got you through a tough time or got you through your drive. If it made your travel or anything you did a little bit better, a little bit calmer than we have done our job for the past 10 ish years. 10 years. We'll round it all. We got to round up there. 10 years. So, and um, yeah, 
and and uh, we'll still be around. We'll still we'll still check in with you all. I'm sure. Babylon Five model. Remember, end of the regular run. Now we do the special Futurama model. Yeah, Futur uh, or Futurama run. We'll probably model. be doing a special near the end of March, and we'll come back with I think some deeper thoughts on you know the length of the podcast. But uh, we just recorded one in. Yeah, this was a long one. We're tired. So uh, we're tired, <laughs> and it may not come out, the, the full video one, uh, until tomorrow, because I'm exhausted uh, already from recording, and i got to edit it. But all right, thanks, Ian. Thanks for being a, a pretty decent podcast partner. Yeah, thank long. you for being a pretty decent podcast partner. Well, I'll, I'll take that. From Ian, that's like gold, I guess, repeating it back to me. <laughs> all right, have a good... I said nice things about you earlier. Yeah, 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 I'll say more yeah, next yeah, podcast. You, you, the one comment you ever gave me when we were, we were talking about a, a fucking crazy idiot that came after me so long, that's when you had to finally <laughs> slip it in. Well, you, you know, this, this person has been sure, slandering you forever. I'm so sure I'm gonna say, if uh, people wanted to look back, they could find at least 10 right. times where I've gone. Uh, at, le at, least, at least eight times. <laughs> at, in, least, at least once a year. At least eight times in 350 <laughs> episodes. It's in there. All right, everyone. Take care. Thanks for listening. See you sooner than later.